Hey everybody, welcome to Our Pass Navigation by Drones Over Canada. It's our first YouTube video and it is part of our new channel. So make sure you like and subscribe to it so you see all the new videos that are coming out. If you haven't done so already, check us out at Facebook, Drones Over Canada. And make sure you listen to the podcast, Drones Over Canada, anywhere you like to listen to your podcasts. Hope you enjoy the video. The first thing we're going to get into is using VFR navigation charts. Now keep in mind that these charts are actually meant for manned aviation and they're not specifically for our pass operations. The biggest thing you'll notice is the scales are quite high. And for the areas that most of us will be flying in, they won't be useful for a navigation purpose. They'll be useful to know what's around us so we can keep our operations safe and legal. Now you can get your charts from wherever you want. You can order them online. Most pilot supply stores will have them in stock. They're about $20 per chart. The two types of charts you're going to want are VNCs or VTAs. A VNC is a VFR navigation chart. It has a smaller scale and it's well designed to be able to pick out landmarks like highways or cities. It also denotes airports and other things that you'll need to know to fly VFR. The VTA is a VFR terminal area chart, and it's for the high and busy airports like Toronto's Pearson or Calgary International. These will denote specific procedures for VFR aircraft that would like to transit the control zone. For anybody operating near a certified airport, you will need one of these charts as they provide even more detail so that you can operate safely. We're going to talk about both of them in the video. The first thing I'm going to touch on, however, is where to get your charts. And there's always people that like the paper charts better. However, I really like digital charts. So if you haven't already, check out flightplan.com. It's completely free. And once you make your login, you can actually access all these charts, plus the Canada Flight Supplement, plus a few other features that we'll show you later. So flightplan.com is a great resource. Keep in mind that we're not associated with them in any way. However, I am a huge fan, so I will give them kudos. Um, when you go to flightplan.com, you'll see on the left-hand side menu, and there's two big spots that I'm a fan of and that I'd like to talk to you guys about. The first one is if you scroll down to navigation, you can actually access all the charts you're going to need. And the other one is airports and FBOs. And that's how we can look up an airport to see if it's certified and get some information on it through the Canada Flight Supplement. One of the biggest questions we get is about latitude and longitude on the charts, specifically how to find our lat and long based on the charts. This is a question that you will most likely get on your RPAS advanced exam for those of you that are doing that. And it has shown up on the basic exam as well. I've gone ahead and used an example of a chart near Midland and circled the latitude and longitude. You'll notice the 45 degrees and the 81 degrees. Now that would be the easiest way to find your rough latitude and longitude. If you wanted to go ahead and make it a little bit more precise, you use the hash marks on both sides of the square there, follow it down and interpolate. The other thing you can do if you're already in the spot that you need to find your latitude and longitude is use Google Maps. They're fantastic for that. And then you can easily find yourself on a map in case you can't find a landmark or another way of doing so. Every VFR navigation chart will have what's called a scale. A scale shows you how much the distance on the chart relates to distance in real life. On the digital charts that I was showing you on flightplan.com, that distance scale will be dependent on how much you zoom in or out on the chart. You'll see it in the bottom left corner and it'll sort of move with the map. That makes it very easy to estimate your distance to things like aerodromes, which will be very important. If you're a fan of the paper charts, you'll still have that scale, but it'll be a fixed size. What you can do then is while you're picking up your charts, ask for a VFR ruler, and they actually make them in the same scale as the chart. So you can easily throw that ruler on top of the chart and guess your distance from an object very, very easily. Keep in mind that they're not always calibrated to nautical miles or kilometers. So really pay attention 
to the unit of measurement. Finding what airspace you're going to operate in is one of the most important things we can do with a VFR navigation chart. Unfortunately, for new RPAS operators in Canada, this is also one of the more difficult exercises. And it's actually the reason that we decided to create this video today for you. As you can see, we use an example of the Toronto Pearson Airport. Feel free to pull that up and follow along if you'd like. We talked about on our Drones Over Canada podcast that the airspace around a busy airport is similar to an upside down cake. The area low and close to the airport itself will be regulated at a much lower altitude than when we get further away. Now this makes sense because it's to accommodate busy and heavy airplanes that generally will fly up or from higher altitudes. You can see consecutive rings around the airport and those are denoting those different levels and types of airspace. I'm going to give you two examples to explain. The first circle I'm going to speak about is our bottom right hand circle and it shows the controlled airspace as class C. It starts at the surface and it extends to 12,500. As a reminder, to operate in this airspace, we would need NAV Canada approval, and we'd have to be a holder of an advanced RPAS certificate. When you look at the other red circles, you can see how the altitudes and the airspace changes. For example, sometimes it will be Class E airspace up to a certain altitude, and then Class C airspace. Now keep in mind that these charts will only go to 12,500 because they are VFR charts and that's as high as VFR aircraft are allowed to operate in Canada. Our next example is an example of two types of airspace. The first one is Class E airspace. If you look at the Kingston control zone, it very does clearly state Class E control zone. Now you'll also see two Class F control zones, one inside that Kingston control zone called CYR, 507 and if you go a little bit to the left you'll see another one called CYR505. Now both of those are class F airspace and they're restricted. Off the top of my head I believe one is a prison. If you wanted more information on those you can look them up to see who the operator is so you could request permission to operate in that airspace. Now around you are going to see some numbers and I'm going to use one as an example. If you go straight north of CYR 507, you'll see a number 736 and in brackets 310. What that is, is an obstacle and it's giving you the height above sea level and then the height above ground. This may also be useful information for you. If you're looking at operating near that area, you have a bit of an idea of what one of the highest obstacles in the area is. As you recall, one of the things we spoke about on our Drones Over Canada navigation episode, which was episode 7, was what's called magnetic variation. Magnetic variation is the variation between magnetic north and true north, and it varies depending where you are on the Earth. VFR navigation charts use a red dashed line to denote variation. I've circled it here on the chart. You'll see that periodically, and that's the easiest way to determine your variation. So you can change between true north and magnetic north. When do you know if you should use a VTA chart or a VNC chart? Well, as we said earlier, if you're operating near a major airport, chances are there is a VTA chart available. If there is one available, is probably your biggest and best resource. You can always look at the VNC as well, but definitely focus on the VTA. It'll give you more detail on the different control zone levels and types, and that way you'll know exactly where you are operating. On our digital charts, the VTAs are denoted by a slightly grayed area on the chart. The VNC is the ungrayed area. If you're purchasing paper charts, 
you'll want to purchase both the VNC that will encompass the area you're operating in, as well as any VTAs that cover airports you'll be operating near. For example, if you like to operate in downtown Toronto, you'll want the VNC covering Toronto, but you'll also specifically want the VTA for Toronto. As an example for some military airspace, I've chose Base Borden near Barrie. Now you'll see a giant red circle. Inside that circle is Base Borden, which is actually an aerodrome, as well as a military base. The Class E control zone is around the aerodrome, but as you can see, it excludes CYR-502, which is Class F restricted airspace. If you look a little bit outside of my circle, you'll see a few airports depicted. There's Barry Air Park to the north, Stainer Clearview, and a private aerodrome called Creemore. If you wanted a little bit more information on how to have a look at those airports in more detail, have a look at our next video on the Canada Flight Supplement. It's going to go into that in a little more detail. And that can be accessed for free using flightplan.com as well. The last thing I'll touch on is the definition change in the chart halfway through the screen. That's because in this digital example, that's the change between the VTA and the VNC. The VTA is to the south or below, and you can see a lot more detail on the roads and the rivers, as well as some more detail on certain airports in the area. It's the VNC on top. This is a feature of the digital charts. If you're using paper charts, you'll obviously have two different charts here and you won't have to worry about this definition. As with everything, practice makes perfect reading these charts. Nobody expects you to be able to read them the first time and it takes years and years of practice for pilots to be able to read them accurately and confidently. I would suggest that you get in the habit of checking these charts every time you're gonna fly the drone. It does two things. One, it gets you more and more comfortable reading them. And two, it makes sure that you're having an accurate assessment of the airspace that you're flying in. These charts should be available for your flight review and should also be available when you're flying. As always, I hope you liked the video. Make sure you like it, follow us, and subscribe to our channel. If you haven't done so already, check out Drones Over Canada podcast anywhere you like to listen to your podcasts.